Well, hello everyone. <laughs> Today we have uh, Lucas Tok for his own annual PhD presentation. The topic that he will present is delay-based photonic reservoir computing, phase encoding in very long versus short cavities, and it is part of the work that he has been doing in the last uh, years, right? Luca, close is yours. So um, I will start with a brief introduction to bit talk about the main goal and main motivation and so the re different research fields that interact. So first, the fact that uh, optical te telecommunication are carrying 99% of the world data. So uh, it's a support, a backbone and a support for, for telecommunication is a fiber optics. And, but so we see that uh, fiber optics are really efficient at uh, transmitting data. And we saw, for example, in the COVID crisis that uh, where basically all of the communication in the world were actually telecommunication and it could support a really high demand in traffic. But however, the, the, the traffic demand still is growing more and more. And um, and we will see, we'll anticipate some limitation uh, in, the, in, in the fiber. And this limitation will are linked to the physical uh, property of the fibers. So typically we have over long distances, we know that uh, the signal will be, uh, will, uh, how to say, will uh, be affected by dispersion and attenuation. So to compensate for, for attenuation, you can do amplification, but also it will uh, bring noise to the system. And, um, and also it's limited in bandwidth. And uh, to to control this effect, and if you increase the the launch power in the fiber, you will generate nonlinear effect. And so to control effect all this effect, uh, there is digital signal processing, which is uh, made in digital uh, hardware, which are all the pre-processing and post-processing that I made to uh, make the transmission well. And um, this this. DSP, so digital signal processing, has some limits too. It's a uh, really complex hardware. It can be really complex. It's energy consuming. And it also brings uh, latency because with the uh, interaction, we, we have to go from optic to uh, electronic. And uh, so uh, a field that has been, uh, I mean, another field of research has been to try to solve DSP with machine learning. So on, in digital hardware. And this, so this can reduce the complexity, but still is in digital hardware. And, um, but another field, I mean, so yeah. And uh, the, another field is to solve machine learning tasks with analog optics. And so this bring a bit uh, a main goal of our research, which is trying to do all these tasks in the same uh, optical domain. So it's a, a bit the main goal, a bit far away goal, but like the direction of the research. So uh, to to solve this machine learning task in the optical domain, we can use different machine learning machine learning algorithm, and I will present the one I would work. I mean, I worked on, and uh, which is reservoir computing. So it's a recurrent neural network, which has fixed connection in the network, and we train only the output closure. That's why it is a hardware friendly, so it's easily implementable. And uh, we had another simplification to that, to be even more hardware friendly, is to, um, instead of having a network spatially distributed, we have a temporal distribution with only one nonlinear transformation, which, which will be delaying time. And to do that, there's a pre-processing step, where, which is uh, called masking, in which each input will be uh, we make the system react differently to the to input. And then at the output on a, a linear classifier, so it's the same as a normal reservoir computing. So to do that, um, we need a physical substrate. And uh, so I will present the one I uh, worked, I worked on and the one we're using. And most now, for now, only the fundamental physics, like how, how it behaves. So we have a semiconductor laser, which if we apply a bias, we have a continuous wave uh, behavior if we photo detect the, the, the light. Um, and we apply an external feedback. So we 
to have the feedback from the reservoir computing and which we can play with the parameter, which is the feedback strength of, uh, of the, uh, in the feedback. So we can attenuate the feedback to have different dynamic dynamical response. For example, here we see that uh, it can be complex. So we have this nonlinear transformation that we expect. Um, and we can also change the size of the cavity, which will bring another dynamical response from the, so here I show the parameter one nanosecond. This one was 20 nanosecond, so long cavity. A short cavity, uh, one nanosecond. So we see that there is an impact. Um, see that, that we fix uh, the bias to near threshold to have more dynamic resolution. I mean, more complex. Um, now, okay, we have a system that has a complex behavior, but we still need to bring uh, information to our system. And one way to do that is to use external injection laser. So knowing that. Semiconductor laser with external feedback has been studied well, and also semiconductor laser with external injection has been also studied. But both together, it's a bit less studied, and it's uh, even more complex to 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 study because uh, all the parameters will play a role and interconnect for the to create the the, 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 the output. And um, so we have. When we are adding the injection, we have two other parameters adding. So the frequency detuning, uh, delta F, and the chi injection, which is injection strength we add to the. And we see that by varying these two parameters, I show three examples that are not exhaustive, but um, just to show some examples. So here we have injection locked behavior, where uh, the response laser locks to the frequency of the of the uh, injection laser. And uh, for these parameters, so we have a strong injection and rather uh, smaller frequency tuning. Then if you, in the same injection, if you uh, put a bit higher the, the frequency tuning, you will have a partial lock regime. We see that we have this behavior, behavior that we had from the only external feedback combined with the, the injection at 40 gigahertz and my first. So these are the, this is the RS spectrum of the photo detected output of the system. It's numerical simulation. And this is uh, uh, yeah, the fre in frequency and in time. Um, now another behavior is unlocked. So we, where we have both the injection and the reservoir that are unlocked. And we see that there is a beating frequency that happen, uh, oscillate at uh, exactly the frequency detuned, 40 gigahertz. Um, and by adding external modulation, so now it's what without modulation, we can bring the input to the, to the system. So now I will come back to the topic of DSP and the task that I will process with this system. Um, so the task is recovering a signal after a, a fiber transmission. So it's a real kind of simple system. So we modulate only the amplitude with PAM4 modulation, so four level of modulation with high launch fiber power and 50 kilometer uh, single mode fiber. And then we, we, we photo detect the, the, the I mean, we do the direct detection to get the output amplitude of the, of the system. The signal is distorted linearly and non-linearly, and we see that here, clearly, we don't see the level of encoding. Um, so to recover the signal, we use a time the reservoir computing, and it was proven uh, numerically and experimentally here at IFIX in different references. And uh, here, OK, it's what we proved for until now, but with uh, this amplitude, we can recover the amplitude of the, of the transmission and, and the levels. Um, now, what me I, I investigated is to to go to coherent detection at, instead of direct detection. So instead of extracting only the amplitude of the of the signal, 
will extract also the phase of the signal. And the input of the reservoir will be coherent. So here we go a bit one step toward uh, this full uh, full optical recovery because if you think about a system where we will feel directly uh, the signal to the without detection, without this stage of detection, which brings a latency and a, it's not straightforward, you will have a coherent input. We will have a phase dependency. So we cannot say, okay, uh, we just delete it and it works and uh, it, will, it will work also. So we have to tr try this. So it's a, like an in-between stage where we do coherent detection and when, then refeed again to our uh, system to recover only the amplitude. So at the output of the of the reservoir, we only photo detect uh, the, the amplitude. So here is the experimental setup in which we tried with Irene uh, this experiment. So as I mentioned, we we photo, uh, we coherently detect the amplitude and the phase of the signal. And to feed it, we use phase and um, amplitude modulation or intensity modulation simultaneously. So we reproduce this in, uh, coherent input and we see, okay, what we what do we expect? Uh, will it destroy completely uh, our performances or will it improve? This was the question. Um, so we use only 32 nodes with a long feedback loop of 24.5 nanoseconds. And um, here are the performances. So yeah, I, I didn't mention that we can also open the loop to do experimental machine instead of reservoir computing, which is a fit for our neural network. There's no recurrency. Um, so with the extreme learning machine processing, we see clearly that with only amplitude, uh, we have we have no uh, no good performance. I mean, performance lower than amplitude and phase. So already we see one thing that phase doesn't destroy the performances, but is also improve the performances in the extreme learning machine case. Um, so we have three uh, regions that we uh, tried. So we see that there is injection locking region by stability and partial locking. The one that worked for this uh, extreme learning machine case was the injection lock locking regime. Um, doesn't work. Okay. Now, the comparison we do between phase and no phase is that uh, so to train each each uh, level, each in each bit, we use different we use uh, surrounding neighbors neighboring bits, and we see that clearly with phase, uh, we need less neighboring bits to recover the signal, so around twenty for the with phase and. With only amplitude, it saturates already at thirty. It saturates at thirty, thirty neighboring bits. Uh, and now, so this is only for the extreme learning machine. Uh, now, we compare this with the reservoir computing scheme. So by plugging the, the feedback. And now, what we see, unfortunately, that uh, it doesn't behave that well. And clearly, when we plug the feedback, we saw a lot of instabilities. And uh, because when you want code phase, everything is more unstable. And uh, so we didn't use phase stabilization. And clearly with this long cavity, we see that the experimental machine behaves better than the reservoir computing, which is not expected. I mean, we know that reservoir computing should improve performances. So as I mentioned with this long cavity, we have a, uh, if we did uh, phase, phase stabilization, we could maybe show that. But as we have a really sh a low number of nodes needed and fast, we need fast also fast computing, the idea is that I investigated numerically what will happen if we will reduce the size of the cavity. And in this case, uh, a short cavity is less sensitive to noise. What, what I didn't try it experimentally because it's really hard to reduce the size of the cavity in the lab. I mean, we have connectors with fiber, which are already really long, so we cannot reduce it to, we will need something like one centimeter uh, loop and uh, it's impossible in the lab. So did it numerically, first to have a 
first result and confirmation that we could do that. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, there are a lot of interdependent parameters that are involved. And another thing that is uh, really important when we do the pre-processing and the encoding is the encoding time. So I, I, I propose four strategies of encoding. Uh, the first one is a more straightforward. That is, uh, you have one feedback loop, uh, one input per feedback loop. So one delay, one, one input. And it's really synchronous. Uh, this we cannot do so much with a, with a long cavity as uh, we, we cannot use that much length. It's too long to do that for this task at least. Um, so what we used to do in the, what we did in the experiment is always leave a buffer, a part that is uh, empty. Uh, for the synchronous part, so we can do two things. One with partially encoded delay in synchronous, so only one uh, one input per delay with a buffer with this, which is empty with no encoding. Or we can do it also asynchronously, so putting several inputs sequentially in the same delay with leaving a buffer or no, no buffer also, which uh, this is what we did for the experiment that I showed before. And this is what we did also, well, what they did here uh, with the long loop. Now I offer other strategy of encoding and we know that the uh, there is a performance boost when you do asynchronous uh, time delays of our computing, it was proven by the, uh, Andre Rom, and um, so it shows that there is a res uh, when the input is resonant with the delay, there is a, uh, a drop in the performances. Uh, so it's also interesting to investigate. Um, so first result with the short cavity. So here in the the first strategy that I uh, offered, so one input per delay with no buffer, and um, we see that first thing we see, we verify that for reservoir computing, for some uh, set of parameters, we have this improvement that can happen compared to only amplitude encoding. So we see clearly a real improvement uh, compared to only amplitude. So here we have a low injection and we see also that it's quite diffuse. We have a lot of points that we could exploit, but they are also really sparsely distributed and uh, with a regular spacing between each other in the two direction of the space, state space. So in frequency detuning, we see that there is a space between each good performance that is regular. It's always more or less the same, which corresponds to uh, one over the, the, the delay two, which is 800 picosecond here. So it's uh, uh, 1.25 uh, gigahertz. And uh, so this is a separation and also a separation in feedback. And I try to explain a bit why we have this, this uh, distribution of the, of the good performances. Um, so the first thing is uh, the distribution in frequency tuning. So here I show an, another, uh, another encoding strategy where I have partially encode delay. So I have one input per delay, so it's synchronous, but there is a buffer at the end of the delay with no encoding. And uh, in this way we can see, is because here, the, the case before we had the delay equal to the encoding time. So we don't know if it's it was, the spacing was equal to the delay or to the encoding time. So to do this discretization, I, um, I, I tried this other encoding uh, strategy. So where our encoding time is 400 picoseconds is, is the same, but the delay is one nanosecond. So is there is this difference. And we see that, and I show it for two delays, so one nanosecond, two nanoseconds. We see that there is still this, this, this uh, what I call resonance. So we have a resonant case and a resonant case. Resonance where our frequency tuning is K time uh, one over our delay. So if one our one over our delay is one gigahertz, k time eight twenty eight point time our delay. 
And here, if we are in non-resonant case, it's an example. So it will be, uh, for example, here, more or less, on the top. We have a loss, uh, drop in the performances. So we need the resonance between the, the delay, as we see, and the, and the, and the frequency tuning to perform well. Um, no? Ah, yeah. So we see the, the different uh, frequency spacing. Uh, no, nothing that when you add feedback to the to the semiconductor laser, there is a shift in the central frequency of the, the laser. So it will not be exactly. Uh, there will be another factor, a shift plus a, a constant uh, that correspond to this shift. So the actual frequency tuning is always not the one that you set at the beginning. Well, this is a comment. Um, now, I, I, I try to show, so we don't see so well, but I try to show um, why is it, what is it separated, uh, distributed sparsely and quite regularly in feedback strengths. So here I show another injection case where we don't see so well, but it behaves better for high frequency tuning as the injection locking, what we aim is a partial locking. So the partial locking happened for higher frequency tuning, as I showed at the beginning. Uh, and what we see is that inside, so I have a zoom where I, not this shading thing. And we see that uh, here in the case of inje uh, strong injection, most of the, the best performances are located in the stable part of the result of the bifurcation diagram. And uh, these yellow lines, we don't see so well, correspond to all the bifurcation and also containing the, the chaotic behavior. Um, now I show another uh, case of low injection, 0.1. And I will go a more uh, more close to the bifurcation to see really where it happens in this case. So where are the good performances? And we see that here I scan the feedback strengths. So there is no injection. It's only the, the semiconductor laser with feedback. And uh, uh, along this feedback strength, we see that for linear, it doesn't work. In a uh, stable regime, it doesn't work. For the the bifurcation, it doesn't work neither, and it works inside the chaotic. So it's different than what we had in the high injection. So these are two examples of two uh, strategies of encoding. And um, and we see that we have, all, again, this resonance between frequency tuning and, uh, and, the, and the encoding time, which vary, we've, I varied it these two different uh, type of encoding and we see that it still corresponds um, so now yeah uh, we I, we see that this performance is a bit lower than this uh, than this one so this one corresponds to one picosecond for one picosecond the matching encoding and, and delay and here it's 400 picosecond and one still one nanosecond of, of delay. And we see that there is a slightly better performance. So I, I just ask uh, the question, like, as we see that here, the, the frequency, the characteristic frequency of the feedback dynamics that are these small peaks, so that don't have so much influence because you have low amplitude peaks, are matching with the encoding uh, frequent characteristic frequency, which are all this encoding. What I say is the encoding, as it's a masking that is periodic, there's a periodicity. We'll have this in frequency, which is a comb of frequency for each separated by the, the period. It was a period. And, yeah. um, and we see that here, the f dynamic uh, behavior in frequency will match with the encoding here. As I use a, a higher, a lower speed, it's one, it's around one gigahertz, or the 
frequency characteristics. So I, I see the matching. I don't say it's uh, the reason of the improvement. I ask, okay, might be that it, it uh, can improve if you have this matching between your cavity and your and your encoding. So to conclude, um, I have shown that we can use phase for transmission to improve uh, recovery performances and uh, show this experimentally on the room cavity for the extreme learning machine case and also in the reservoir computing for the short cavity. Uh, the, the long cavity, so oh, yeah, the long cavity doesn't work with phase experimentally if we don't have phase stabilization. Uh, and now short cavity has been verified numerically and it offers also higher speed of computation. So I think it's a direction that will go if we want to use time zero as our computing to reduce the short, to reduce the cavity, at least for this task. And um, now, yeah, optimal par parameter has to be taken into account because it's really sparsely distributed uh, into the state space and typically use uh, efficient encoding start strategy. Thank you, Luca, for the presentation. Let me stop recording now.